Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Tony Solomon. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to what is the last of this series of Lunch and Learn sessions as we take a little bit of a break for the summer. As many of you know, I work with the GEM project. It's an employability and social inclusion project which supports people in Gloucestershire by providing one-to-one -one support to help them to get into work further education or training. Uh, we're funded by the European Social Fund and the National Lottery Community Fund and over the uh, last five years the partnership that is GEM have supported over 2,000 people in Gloucestershire, many of whom are now in work, further education or training, so um, really really good stuff. But one of the things that's emerged from the work we've been doing is the development of a fresh initiative which we're calling Inclusivity Works and this is all about raising awareness and helping um, employers to really recognise and realise the many business benefits of having a, diver a diverse workplace and an inclusive culture in the workplace. Now, today, our spotlight is on building a more trauma-informed workplace. We are recording this session and it will be available with subtitles on our website, inclusivityworks.org. Um, after the session, we will be sending you a summary of the key points, together with some useful tips. As far as questions go, may I ask that you um, put them in the chat box or in the Q&A box, which hopefully you'll find at the bottom of your screen, and I'll make sure we, we get your questions answered. So, I'm absolutely delighted to have with me today a former GEM participant, Jo Tim. Today, Jo is the director of Lime Training, her own organisation, and Jo delivers bespoke lived experience mental health training across Gloucestershire. Jo is a qualified teacher, but she made the career change to use her own lived experience of mental illness to raise awareness and inspire hope in others. So, Jo, a very warm welcome. Lovely to see you today, and over to you. You can take yourself off mute. There Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, I'll Tony. That's I'll, great. I'll disappear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Let me just try and share my screen. Um, hopefully, this will work. Uh, Oh dear. All right, let's try this one. Oh, that looks good. Does that look good? We can see it. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Let's start the slideshow. Can you see that okay? We can. Perfect. Right. So thank you to everybody who's attending, um, coming to learn about building a more trauma-informed workplace. Um, I just thought I'd give you a little bit of information. Um, about me. Um, like Tony said, um, I'm a previous GEM participant. Um, I've suffered with mental illness for many years and prior to in becoming involved with GEM I'd been unemployed for six years due to receiving treatment for my mental illness. Um, but again, as Tony said, historically I'd been a school teacher and then I was a special educational needs teaching assistant before moving to work to the County Council in Children's Services. Um, throughout my time out of work, though, I became increasingly convinced that there wasn't enough awareness out there about a mental illness, particularly anything that wasn't anxiety or depression, and b about what it really feels like to live with mental illness. So that's what led me to want to set up Lime, which is a lived experience mental health training company, which um, offers bespoke training to organisations that want the inside story. So what it's like to live with these mental illnesses, as well as the textbook definitions of them. Um, also, alongside running Lyme now, I also work for the NHS in the Complex Emotional Needs Service as a lived experience practitioner. So again, this involves raising awareness amongst professionals um, about different mental illnesses, particularly complex emotional needs, um, but also working one-to-one -one alongside patients and offering them hope for their own recoveries, um, a bit like I've made headway in my recovery. I try and offer that hope that other people can do the same thing. So that's a bit about me. So what about what we're going to talk about today? So firstly, we're going to cover what is trauma. I'm going to give you a definition of what trauma is and talk about how that's actually 
possibly quite different to what most people think of when they think of the word trauma. Then we're going to cover how can trauma impact the workplace. And then thirdly, we're going to look at how um, employers can become more trauma informed to improve working practices. So I just want to kind of raise at this point that some people might find aspects of this pre presentation triggering. You know, we are talking about different types of trauma. So please remember to take time for yourselves, take time out if you need to do so, that's absolutely fine. Okay, so starting with what is trauma? So the circles on the PowerPoint um, illustrate different types of events which people might think of if they were asked to name something traumatic. I've split them into four main groups and given a couple of examples within each um, sector, but in reality there are far, far more. So just as a few examples, um, I've got environmental traumas, which are things that are affected obviously by the environment um, and what's going on around people. So the recent pandemic, COVID pandemic is an example of one potential trauma um, and then war as well. So obviously uh, the war in Ukraine is quite relevant to that at the moment. Um, then there's injustice related traumas such as racism and homophobia. Um, violence related traumas such as domestic violence or more general violence, um, for example, if you're a victim of a mugging or a burglary or something like that, and then sexual violence as well. And then there's another miscellaneous category, which quite a lot of things fall into, but the examples I've given are car accidents or economic uncertainty, um, which could possibly go in environmental as well. As you can see, quite a lot of these things overlap. Um, but obviously economic uncertainty is another particularly relevant area at the moment, given the cost of living crisis. Um, as we will find out, trauma is a personal experience. So potentially, if it affects someone negatively in a traumatic fashion, then really anything could be a trauma. So don't feel it's just kind of restricted to those examples I've given. There is a potential that anything in life could be traumatic to somebody because it's how it affects that person on a personal level. Um, that leads us nicely to the official definition of trauma as given by the DSM-5. So the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for the Classification of Illnesses. It's published in America, but it's used worldwide. Um, and it defines trauma as exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violation. But I wonder whether this is too pathologizing for everyday use in society, because obviously, as I stated, the DSM is a manual for uh, classification of illnesses and not everyone who has experienced trauma has a mental illness. So it's not the case that if you have a traumatic history or you have something that was traumatic in your life, you're therefore going to have a mental illness. You could just have trauma from that incident and go about your life, you know, me otherwise mentally healthy and just have that one trauma that's that can still bother you. Um, so yeah, I wonder whether that's actually too, too narrow a definition and actually maybe more in society that the definition that I gave previously that potentially anything could be a trauma depending on the, uh, or a trauma kind of related situation depending on how the person reacts to that. So perhaps the biggest misconception regarding trauma is that it is the event that leads to the trauma. For example, you might think that someone who has been in a house fire, for example, will be traumatized because of the fire itself. However, that's not necessary, well, it's not the case. It's trauma is actually response led rather than situation led. So in the fire house fire example, it would be how the person re responded to the fire and the support they got, whether they got out of the building okay, whether they were injured, whether they had um, support afterwards, how they felt about the fire afterwards, all those things, which leads to whether it would be traumatic or not. It wouldn't be just the fact that they've been in a house fire, therefore they are traumatised. Um, this means that people respond differently to different things, which when you think about it is actually quite obvious and natural. But it does mean that if two people experience the same event at the same time, one could be legitimately traumatised and the other one might not be, depending on the responses that each one got to being in the traumatic situation. Um, so that's what I mean when I talk about trauma for the rest of this presentation. So it's the response from the traumatic incident that I'm talking about, not the traumatic incident itself. Okay, so what makes the difference then between people who get traumatized and people who don't get traumatized? 
Um, this slide gives a simple illustrative case study of how two people might react differently to a potentially traumatic event. So firstly, we've got Sam. Sam was involved in a drink drive traffic collision as the victim of that collision. He sustained injuries requiring a stay in a hospital, but he was well supported by family and friends and colleagues, and he felt safe and well, ca well cared for by the hospital and the people who care came to care for him at home afterwards. He understood that the collision was not his fault and that he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Then we've got Bill. Bill witnessed Sam's road traffic collision and was the first person on the scene. He sustained no injuries himself other than mild shock after the event, but he was reluctant to talk about the event to friends and family after someone joked that he shouldn't be so shook up because it wasn't him that got hit. So he felt psychologically unsafe to let colleagues know what he had seen because he was afraid that he might get a similar reaction from them. And he felt that he should have done more to prevent the collision. And so he no longer feels safe behind the wheel. So in an in a everyday situation, if you were presented with these two people, you might be thinking that it's Sam who's gone through the traumatic incident himself he was the victim of the road traffic collision he's the one who's going to be traumatized but actually in this example it's bill that's come out traumatized whereas sam has responded to the trauma in an entirely uh, positive and kind of positive way and has been able to move on from it um so this raises two key points firstly that witnessing events can cause trauma. You don't have to be the victim of the events themselves. So witnessing events can cause trauma um, just as much as the actual event. So this is particularly relevant where if we think about um, children who are living at homes where domestic violence is a problem, even if they're not the victims of the domestic violence, but they witness it, then they are likely to become traumatized um, as a result of that, even if it hasn't happened to them personally. And secondly, it illustrates well how it's the event, how the event is dealt with that leads to the trauma, not the event itself. So in the example given, Sam experienced a lot of support followed, following the accident, both immediately and in the longer term. He was encouraged to talk about his feelings about the incident, his injuries, etc. He felt both safe, both psychologically and physically, because he knew the collision wasn't his fault. By contrast, Bill did not feel safe or psychologically held. His concerns were mocked and not taken seriously, and he had no one to rationalise his mistaken belief that he could have prevented the collision with, so he's also consumed with guilt. So trauma is personal. Whether someone becomes traumatised or not depends on the factors such as support after the event, how safe they feel, and whether the memory gets processed properly. Memories that are not processed properly can become frequently triggering, and these can lead to mental health issues such as post-traumatic stress disorder or personality disorders, for example. But again, just to stress, not everybody who goes through trauma will go on to develop mental illness. Okay, so we'll have a look now at how trauma can impact the workplace. Um, I've split this into three uh, main areas to talk about. Um, firstly, how individuals seek psychological safety within a workplace. Secondly, that workplaces that don't promote, promote tra trauma-informed culture are likely to exacerbate old traumas for employees. And thirdly, that uh, organisations that focus solely on productivity and efficiency actually aren't likely to become that productive or efficient. So taking each one of these in turn, the first one, um, individuals or in the workplace example, employees are always seeking safety within their environments. That's natural. People to feel safe physically, but also psychologically. So psychological safety with regards to trauma was coined by Amy Edmondson and applies particularly to those employees who have some kind of trauma history. These people are always seeking that safety and support that they may not have received during the original trauma. They need to know that they are in a trustworthy environment, that it's okay to be struggling, or that even simple things like not knowing the answer to something is actually okay that they're not going to get berated or mocked because they don't know. They need to feel supported and require a culture of trust and connection. So if individuals are not made to feel supported or in fact are subjected to policies or actions within the workplace that make them feel more vulnerable, for example, if a um, manager doesn't respond well to a complaint against ra uh, of racism, for example, 
or um, employees are made to feel vulnerable by being asked to return to the workplace mid COVID pandemic, they are likely to have their old traumas reignited. So on this uh, section here, the orange section, I've talked about a trauma informed culture. Um, I just want to highlight what that means. So a trauma informed culture is one of trust and connection where the vulnerability of employees is avoided at all costs. So that example that I've just given, uh, they're trying, they, they made the employees feel more vulnerable by not taking the complaint of racism seriously or by asking them to come back in and work mid COVID pandemic. Um, so that's not an example of being trauma, uh, having a trauma informed culture um, and an impact on the workplace because it makes people feel uh, that they, they're, well, they just feel less safe. They feel like they're less able to trust what's going on and they feel like they're being made to feel more vulnerable. Um, finally, so on this slide, the workplaces that are solely focused on productivity and efficiency and not on the pastoral care of their employees, or they, if they don't foster psychological safety, are actually likely to be less efficient. This is because staff are always worried in these environments about doing or saying the wrong thing and facing recriminations for that. So those recriminations could just be so-called office banter or more formal disciplinary action. So staff need to be able to talk to each other openly and honestly, peer to peer and further up the chain of command. So people need to be able to feel that they can raise issues when, as and when they arise. Um, so they're not constantly worrying about them or worrying about the impact of what, how they're going to be taken if they do raise those issues. And they need to feel safe so that if they're, you know, really on a really basic level, if they don't know how to do something, they need to feel safe enough to ask how to do something rather than just pretending, getting it wrong and then getting the organisation into trouble because they made the wrong decision. So, yeah, um, pastoral care and psychological safety are really important within uh, organisations and the workplace. Um, this slide, uh, I really like this quote um, because I believe it really sums up a trauma informed approach. Um, it says that when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. So if there's something bothering somebody, whether that be a big trauma such as the death of a spouse or a little trauma such as an ongoing dispute with a colleague, then the way to support that person is by doing the work around them to offer the required support you don't expect them to change themselves. So every business wants to be the best it can be and the efficacy of that business depends on the contentment of its employees. So you want to be supporting the employees, not expecting the employees themselves to change. And this re leads really well into our final topic of the webinar, which is how can employees, sorry, how can employers become more trauma informed? Okay, so, there are five core principles for effective trauma informed practice, and I've identified those as safety, trust, choice, collaboration and empowerment. And I've put key icons next to safety and empowerment because, in my opinion, these are the two principles that underpin everything trauma informed and all the other principles feed into them. So we'll look at these in more detail over the next few slides. Okay, so firstly, safety and trust. So when we're talking about safety, as I've already kind of hinted at already, we're talking about two different types of safety. We're talking about physical safety and we're talking about psychological safety. So to feel physically safe, we need to feel welcomed, clean, comfortable in our environment and our surroundings need to give this impression. So an example I've got of this um, not being the case and me feeling not particularly safe in, in an environment that I went into where I should have been was I a few years ago had a psychiatric appointment with my psychiatrist um, in an NHS building. Um, I was shown to the waiting room. I'd never been to this building before. I was shown to the waiting room and um, said waiting room was very uh, neglected, shall we say. So it had plants in the corners of the room which hadn't been watered for what must have been forever because the, the plants were kind of on their last legs. The chairs were all, um, they were made of that kind of pretend leather effect uh, material and they were all cracked and all the foam was coming through so the chairs looked really well worn and like they hadn't been replaced for years. All the posters on the walls were all curling, they were coming off the walls. 
And it really created an impression in me, like, goodness me, if they can't get the waiting room to look like somewhere that is welcoming and somewhere that I want to sit, then I really don't know if they are actually can be bothered to care for me as a patient. And I don't know whether the psychiatrist is actually going to be, you know, up to his job. And I got all of that worry and all of that kind of feeling just because the environment wasn't welcoming, clean and comfortable. So it might seem like an obvious thing, but actually it's something that's quite easily neglected. So physical safety is really important and just as important as psychological safety. Um, so when I'm talking about psychological safety, it's about knowing what to expect and where boundaries lie. Um, and that's a really key concept to feeling safe. So on the slide, it says, are there clear communication practices? So employees at all levels are kept in the loop and know what to expect of themselves and others. And are relationships positive and supportive, both in terms of in times of explicit trauma and more implicitly? So by that, I mean relationships need to be supportive in times of explicit trauma. For example, if an employee was experiencing domestic violence, but more also more implicitly. So when employees know that the supportive atmosphere enables them to raise more day to day concerns with their peers, if those day to day concerns were less left unresolved and they didn't feel safe to uh, ask their peers about them, then they could lead to conflict and lead to reduced productivity. So you can see how everything links back to together. Um, trust, trust, as you will see in a moment, is really cl clearly and uh, kind of consciously linked to safety. Um, on the slide, it talks about are there clear and consistent boundaries for all employees? Do they know what to expect? Are the issues raised taken seriously and not brushed aside? Is there a strong team morale where employees are seen as allies with each other? And our decision making process is transparent. All of those things are all kind of really important in developing a culture of trust within an organization. And trust is obviously a core principle of becoming trauma informed. So that it's really important from that point of view as well. OK. Moving on, looking at choice and collaboration. So choice. Choice works on two levels and links to other concepts of respect and dignity, which are also sometimes quoted as core principles of trauma-informed care. So on the slide, it talks about, does the individual have appropriate levels of choice and control over matters that affect them? That's really important. If something's going to affect somebody in an organization at any level, then they need to have a, a degree of choice over that matter, You know, whether they partake in it or not, or how it's going to change things for them. Um, this can link to cultural, historic and gender issues. For example, can clients and employees access information in a different language? Do they have a choice, of, a, for example, of accessing the welcome menu when they phone up in a different language that's more appropriate to their culture or their um, kind of background? And also, um, do you encourage the inclusion of pronouns in your email signatures, for example? So including at the bottom of your signature, um, how you prefer to be referred to, whether it's he, him, her, them, they, them, their, she, <laughs> hers, I always get forget one or the other of those. Um, but by including um, the, the possibility of including pronouns at the bottom of email signatures makes those people who feel that they want to include them feel more included and it's more a more inclusive environment but people also have the choice then whether they want to include them or not but you know by making it explicit that they can't they have that choice um actually it can make a huge difference in terms of how people feel within an organization um, collaboration. So collaboration and co-production are increasingly becoming organisational buzzwords. The principle is that nothing should be done for people, but rather with them. A flattened hierarchy within organisations is much more trauma informed since everyone's voice matters and people are listened to with actions taken if appropriate. So on the collaboration box, it talks about our decisions about teams made within teams wherever possible. Um, the fact that everyone should have a role to play in ensuring the safety, support, choice and empowerment of others. And by everyone, I mean everyone within the organisation, not just the people who normally make the decisions, but everyone within the organisation. And are employee and client views taken into account and listened to and not just heard? 
So are things really done as a result of what people have raised um, and, you know, as, as a response of being listened to rather than just being heard and kind of ignored? So, you know, a really simple example of that is in um, supermarkets, they often have, um, it's the same with the NHS as well, actually, um, they have examples of you said we did kind of examples. So in the supermarket, there might be a feedback box and it might say, you know, on Friday lunchtimes, it's really busy and there's never enough checkouts open. And then they say what we did is we opened more checkouts on Friday lunchtimes and everybody's happy. Um, so that's an example of things actually being done and things being listened to, not just heard. OK, so the final fifth uh, key core principle of trauma informed care is empowerment. And like safety, I put a key next to it because I think it's a key principle and everything else leads to this, as you'll see when we go through these examples in the box. So are employees and clients empowered to make the right decisions for themselves at the right time? For example, do they know when to take time off if they're feeling unwell or if they're struggling with a personal issue? Or do they know when to raise concerns, etc.? This links to the choice element that we've already talked about. Are managers and peers really listening to and validating people? Sometimes it's not just about trying to fix a problem. We all need a good vent. So that links to collaboration and people feeling like they can talk to anybody within the organisation about any of their concerns at any point and knowing that they'll get a validating response. And by a validating response, I mean something that says that it's OK for somebody to be feeling this way and not necessarily jumping in with, oh, yeah, well, when I felt this way, I found this really helpful or what I think you need to do to fix the problem is X. Just validating them, just letting them know that it's OK that they feel that way and it's understandable that they feel that way and listening to how they do feel. Um, yeah, listening to um, somebody is often more important than jumping in and just trying to fix the problem. Um, are community traumas acknowledged or ignored? This sets the standard for safety and trust. So an example of this, um, sadly, um, uh, in recent months, um, somebody who I worked with within the NHS um, trust where I worked um, died and they were did quite a lot of work quite closely with our team and our team manager um, was really good about being proactive and launching um, meetings and having reflective practice and uh, sessions where we could all meet together, discuss how the death of this colleague had affected us and how we were coping as individuals as well as employees. And this set the standard for the fact that this community trauma was acknowledged and it was dealt with really well. And now as an employee, I feel that I have got that safety and trust within the team. And because the community trauma was dealt with well, I feel more comfortable in raising any of my own particular personal traumas should any arise, because I know that that example was handled really well and it increased the trust and safety that I felt within the team. Um, and then finally, are employees asked how they would like to be supported? And is there an open channel of communication, especially during times of difficulty? Okay, so then finally, before we go on to questions, I've got a slide that talks about the path to becoming a truly trauma-informed organisation. Now, I appreciate that the writing on these arrows is quite small, so I'm going to read them out um, to you. So, firstly, the first step in becoming a tra truly trauma-informed organisation is that the organisation becomes trauma-aware. This means they've got a basic awareness of signs and implications of trauma and staff start to discuss this. Then it becomes a trauma sensitive organisation where staff start to explore principles of trauma informed care and consider how they might implement them. Then the organisation moves to the trauma responsive stage where there's change at all levels of the organisation and procedures and practices have begun to become reconsidered. And then finally, the uh, final stage is trauma-informed organisation, where there's a full implementation of trauma-informed practice, a culture of trauma-informed care with clients and with each other. The good news is that by attending this webinar, you are all already at the trauma-sensitive stage. But from this point onwards, it's how the organisation that you work for as a whole takes on this information, uses it to inform policies and practices, 
and trains the whole organization in trauma-informed principles that will make your organization fully trauma-informed. So this becoming trauma-informed, it says, is often a huge cultural shift, but that begins with our treatment of ourselves. So obviously this can sound quite overwhelming and like quite a big task, but beginning a huge cultural shift can seem quite daunting. So if you start small, you're more likely to succeed. And an example of this is taking good care of yourself. So negative self-talk is really common in life. So how many times a day do you say to yourself, either in your head or out loud, oh, I'm such an idiot, why did I do that? That's something that happens all the time, but it's really not trauma-informed. And if you're going to start advocating trauma-informed care for others, then you need to ensure that you're kind to yourself and start doing it with yourself too. So that's a really good way of starting the cultural shift. Start it with yourself and then with your colleagues, and then you can begin to implement it on a wider level. And then finally, it's also important that all members of an organisation are signed up to a trauma-informed approach for it to be truly trauma-informed. So by that, I mean literally all members of an organization so not just the managers or the people making decisions or the people who are client facing but also um people like cleaners people like receptionists people who you might not necessarily think of are uh, as being important to a trauma-informed approach actually everybody needs to be invested in the trauma-informed culture for the for the organization to have that trauma-informed culture fully embedded so training is a really key part of making sure that you get you reach that final final trauma informed uh, stage on the diagram okay i think that's the end of the presentation and if we go to any questions tony over to you do we have questions <laughs> oh i can't hear you you're on mute tony that's better can you hear me now i can yes right okay um Thank you. That, that was fantastic. I'm going to start with a comment, actually, which has come through from Sarah Fotheringham. And Sarah works with asylum seekers and refugees at Garris. And she says, love your presentation and lived experience made it so useful for all. Really appreciate the point about the care taken to make all environments, especially waiting rooms, welcoming and cared for. Working with asylum seekers and refugees, we make sure we have a really welcoming welcome area. Really good point. Thank so, you. you know, that completely scuppered your entire experience with that psychiatrist just yeah. you know, and, and it makes us think I, i'm thinking at the moment about my welcome areas where, where we are so that, that that's great um question wise um you you the, the slide on which the sunflower which you yeah. particularly like the quote that you don't change the sunflower you you change the environment yes and I sort of get that, you know, if you've planted a sunflower in, in um, poor soil, et cetera, et cetera. But the sunflower doesn't, isn't able to take a great deal of personal responsibility for their environment. They sort of get dumped in the poor soil and, and that. So I wouldn't, we're not in any way suggesting we absolve our personal responsibility for helping to improve our circumstances. Mm -hmm. And rather than, as, as it were, as that sunflower is being a bit of a victim of the circumstance. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, that's a really good point. Obviously, I gave the example of the sunflower. And like you say, the sunflower doesn't get much choice as to where it's put or what's going on with it. It's kind of can't say, well, hang on a minute, I think I'd be better over there in the sun. And if you water, you know, a few days it might be helpful. Um, so, yeah, no, not at all. We're not absolving ourselves of responsibility. And, you know, it, it is important that um, people use their voices to um, kind of raise concerns or you know give examples of how they might function better within an organization but in order to do that there needs to be a, quite a strong trusting kind of collaborative trauma-informed background to the organization in the first place so that person feels safe and able to raise issues whereas otherwise they might feel a little bit like the sunflower kind of sitting in the corner thinking you know I wish I could say that actually I'd be much better if if I could raise this concern and I've got a problem with my colleague but I'm too scared to raise it because I think everybody's going to make fun of me and all of that they might kind of <laughs> sort of rescind into the sunflower option and kind of sit there going I wish I could do something but I don't feel safe enough to do it so it's kind of about having that trauma-informed background and culture to the organization so that people feel comfortable in 
taking on their own responsibilities to make things better for themselves as well, I guess. Yeah. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, we, we talk about being trauma informed and the importance, if you really outline the importance of that. We talk a lot about inclusivity these days and diversity and we talk about inclusive cultures and those cultures that the, the inclusivity enabling businesses to be more productive, to be more efficient. And I think what you're saying is trauma and inf being informed about trauma is really important as part of having that inclusive culture where there was another thing you mentioned was allyship. Could you talk a little bit more about what you meant there? Yeah, so um, I think, yeah, again, you've kind of hit the nail on the head that um, being trauma informed is is uh, is only as effective as in as an organization is inclusive generally so it's not going to work if you're you say yeah yeah we're really trauma informed but we don't have like accessibility we we still got accessibility issues for people to access the you know building they can't get in if they're disabled for example or they can't access our um website if they don't speak english all of those kinds of things if those things aren't in place then you can't say that you're trauma informed because you need all of those things to be implemented and you need the inclusivity to be there in order for the trauma-informed section to work. Um, so yeah, it's important that um, people are open to, you know, all the other topics that you've been discussing in the Inclusivity Works um, webinars, actually, they've all been really important in, in terms of all those things need to be embedded into an organization as well as trauma-informed care. You can't kind of pick and choose and say, well, we're going to be trauma-informed, but we're not going to be inclusive to LGBT rights, for example, or we're not going to be inclusive to asylum seekers, or we're not going to be inclusive to disabled people. You need all of those things in order to become trauma-informed. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Yeah, very, very much so. Um, there's a couple of comments coming through. A really interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, would love uh, to invite you to speak at our organisation. We'll contact you separately. Fantastic. From Sarah. So, and, and again, Joe, we'll be sending out your details, your contact details with the top tips um, after this presentation. Um, so top three tips, if you could give us the top three tips to employers to make the change. Ooh. You know, they are where they are at the moment. They're a good solid old insurers are doing what they've been what they say don't they if you always do what you always did you'll always get what you always got and let's assume a lot of people are like that but we're looking for change so what are the top three things those those guys girls could do Ooh. to begin to begin the process that's a tricky one to whittle it down to three but i think the first thing is something that i touched on at the end of the presentation that in order to be trauma informed it needs to start at home kind of you need to start with yourself you need to be trauma informed in your own approach to your own way of talking to yourself your own way of thinking your own way of doing things you can't be really self-critical and then go to work and say right I'm going to be really trauma informed today and I'm going to be really inclusive for all my you know clients and I'm going to work really well with my colleagues and I'm going to make them feel really safe and you know they're going to be able to raise their concerns with me if if you don't start with yourself and aren't kind to yourself, then none of that's going to work. So I'd say the, the biggest thing you can do and that probably the smallest thing you can do as well. So it's quite it's quite possibly the easiest thing you can do to start on your trauma informed journey is be kinder to yourself. And in being kinder to yourself, you'll then see the impact that has on you and then you will see how it can impact on other people. So I would say that would be one. Um, I'd also say. Um, again it links back to the little keys that I put on the um, two core principles of trauma-informed care so the safety and the empowerment I think I would say um, making sure that your environment um, in your organization is safe both physically and psychologically um, for somebody to be able to partake in um, kind of whether that be a sort of day-to-day -day employee partaking in or whether you're talking about your clients coming to your organization and partaking in your organization so I think safety is one and then the third one would be empowerment allowing people to feel empowered and having that 
flattened as flattened as you can hierarchy so that everybody's voice is heard and everybody's voice matters just as much as everybody else's. I think they would be my top three tips. Thank you. And that I think when we, we look at typical leadership structures and you've talked mm. about the latter structures and voices being heard from the bottom of the chain all the way through to the top. Very often a board of directors will sit around and say, yep, let's sign off on a diverse and inclusive um, policy because HR think it's a great idea. Let's go with it, guys, and carry on as usual. Is there a real need for our leaders to be much more vulnerable? Definitely. Much more self-aware of their own, but be being prepared to share that vulnerability, to set the example for others to really feel, yeah, this is an environment in which I can express myself. Definitely. And like you say, by being um, open to that vulnerability and allowing other people's views to be heard, you're not only kind of flattening the hierarchy and making it easier for everybody's voice to matter, but you're doing that. You're giving the example that being vulnerable is OK and that by being vulnerable, it's it's not a weakness. It's OK to be vulnerable and to ask for help and to ask for things to be kind of improved or looked at a different way. That's that's completely fine. So if the the directors of the organization or the company or the managers or whoever are being that vulnerable vulnerable kind of layer then it kind of it's it's a really good example on two fronts in that it flattens the hierarchy and it shows that being vulnerable is okay and that it's fostering that safety so if they feel safe enough to ask other people what their views are then those other people should feel safe enough to give those views as well Joe, thank you. And uh, thank you all very much for joining us today. Now, I mentioned at the beginning Inclusivity Works, and you can find out more about Inclusivity Works and the support that's available to your organisation on your diversity and inclusion journey uh, by visiting our web website, www.inclusivityworks.com, or joining our LinkedIn site, which we'd love you to do, or contacting me or my colleague, Sue Gilding, we'd be happy to meet with you. Because together with your help, we want to make Gloucestershire a beacon for embracing diversity and inclusion, changing the employment landscape for the better. Uh, as I mentioned, we will be sending you a summary of Joe's um, presentation with contact details. A full recording with subtitles will be available uh, on the uh, website. And please do sign up to our newsletter. We keep you regularly informed with all sorts of interesting things, not just about what we do, but what the wider diversity and inclusion arguments are going forward. Now, in a few moments, uh, there will be a very short survey popping up on your screen and also a link uh, in the chat box. Just spend a moment, if you would, answering the two or three questions. It helps us enormously as we plan for the uh, future for our next series of lunch and learn sessions in the autumn. So suggest some topics for us that you'd like to see covered and we'll make sure that's dealt with. So all that's left for me to do on behalf of Joe, on behalf of the whole GEM team is to thank you for joining us today and over previous sessions. We look forward to seeing you again in the autumn if not before and in the meantime wishing you all a very very good summer. Thank you.